Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we are live. Bonjour, dickheads. Welcome uh, to another episode of my live podcast. It's every Monday night at 9 p.m. French time, uh, except today is Monday, the 22nd of January, and it is 3 p.m. where I am because I'm in the wonderful city of New York. New York! Um, for a bunch of different reasons, which I'll get into. Uh, so hello. Uh, to, welcome to Monday Night Live. Uh, I've rebranded the show, uh, the podcast. I'm calling it M Paul Taylor's Monday Night Live because I'm Paul Taylor and it's Monday Night Live. I mean, technically, it's Monday Afternoon Live. But you know what I mean? Shut up. Most of you uh, are in France uh, watching this. If you're watching it live, hello. Hi. Um, I am going to open... Uh, 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 I, I just found this in the local convenience store. It's like a ginger... Ale. I don't really know the difference between ginger ale and ginger beer, to be honest. It's got floating bits of ginger in it. Uh, so I was like, fuck it, let's do it. And it's from Brooklyn. Um, and America knows what's up because it's a twist to open rather than having to have a bottle opener. Why don't we have the twist to open stuff in Europe? I don't understand. Anyway, cheers, everyone. Uh, Sante. Oh, yes, that'll do. Yeah, all right, it's not as strong as a ginger beer, uh, but it's, it's delicious nonetheless. Anyway, if you're watching or listening to this, uh, it might look and sound different because I'm using my iPhone with a different microphone today than I normally am when I'm at home in my studio in Paris. Uh, so how are you, everyone? How are you? Um, Mushroom Nerd says, hey, hello from New York City as well. Uh, we've got Eve Stadler who's in the house. We've got Kazukio, Pokraj, Roy, uh, Nuage Arbre. That's a great name for a YouTube channel. Nuage Arbre. <laughs> Anton Benedict, what hotel? I'm not telling you, Anton Benedict. Um, um, oh, Bratis, Bratis Labat. Hello, it's my first time here. Hi, everyone. Well, hello, welcome to the show, my friend. I'm glad that you're here. Um, uh, uh, and I uh, hope you have a good time. Uh, say hello, everyone. Uh, AW says the video quality is superb. Thank you. Uh, it's my iPhone 13 Pro, uh, which is... Uh, two years old with, I do have a light. I did go down to a camera shop and buy a light uh, that is shining in my face because the light in the room wasn't enough. Um, so that, that's probably also what helps. Lighting is everything, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Carlos Camejo is in the house. Um, so uh, listen, uh, how are you everyone? Welcome, uh, welcome, welcome along to the, to the Monday Night Live. Uh, I'm in New York. Uh, I, uh, I'm here for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, the main reason I came here was to do a show in French. Ironically, I was hosting a French show called the Frenchy Comedy Club. Uh, and uh, there was a bunch of comedians on that show. We did two shows, uh, one at 7 p.m., one at 9 p.m. at the Sony Hall uh, on Friday. What day is it today? It's Monday. I just... Uh, um, give me a shout out if you came to that show, by the way. If you're in, um, if you're in New York and you came to the show, let me know uh, if, if you came to the show. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask your opinion of it before I give you mine. Do you know what I mean? Just, it just, because I need to remind myself that everything's not shit, okay? <laughs> mm. uh, Anton Benedict says, USA tour. It's not a tour, it's just New York. Um, and uh, a, 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 a French gala show. Plus, I have managed to do some English shows uh, in New York as well. I'll tell you all about those in a bit as well. Um, so, yeah, it was just, listen, the show uh, in French, I, I think New York's a mistake. I think coming to New York has been a mistake. It's just, I'm just, what am I doing here? I, I like, <laughs> getting texts from my wife every day that my daughter misses me. And I'm sitting here like a dickhead in a hotel room going like, all right, cool. I, uh, I want to do comedy in English. I want to do more comedy in English. Let me go to New York where it's all happening. Um, and so we did the French show. Uh, and the French show, honestly... It was all right. It was it. It wasn't too bad. It wasn't amazing, um, it, but it wasn't great uh, in terms of just it, the, the room. The Sony Hall is pretty cool. It's like three hundred and fifty seats, um, and uh, it was it was fun. It, it, the show was fun. I was hosting it, but I felt like the audience were very French. They were very uh, with withheld. That's not an English word. They were very held back. They didn't laugh a lot um, for me in any case. Uh, which was weird. Uh, I don't know. I just, I, I was struggling to host the show. My, I can't improvise in French when I'm talking to the audience. It doesn't work. Um, I don't know why they had me host the show. The organization, it was all over the place as well. Uh, so it was, um, 
yeah, it was, listen, it was fun. I, I had fun in the end. Uh, there was eight of us on stage. Uh, I'd say half of which did really well. Half of them were kind, no, I'd, more than half did really well. The other half were, uh, it was a little quiet. The reception from the audience was a, was a little timid. Um, which show went best out of the two? I don't know. Uh, probably the first one, I think. The problem is people were eating during the show, at the beginning of the show, people were ordering food at both shows. And so when you're eating, you're not laughing, right? So it sounded like we were dying on our ass. Uh, so <laughs> um, it, was, uh, it was interesting. Uh, Mushroom Nerd says, double show on Friday. I had a great time, even though I was alone. Some of the bits were pauf, me, your bits were amazing. Also you bringing back the Quebecois bit from So British is great. Um, yeah, we had some Quebecois comedians on the show, so uh, I brought back some of my uh, Quebecois material uh, to talk, uh, or to introduce them, or to post-produce them. But as you said, Mushroom Nerd, some of the audience just didn't gel with some of the comedians. Uh, it, it wasn't my favourite show uh, ever, if I'm honest. Uh, so it was, it's that thing where you go, it's New York, it's fucking New York, mate. We're doing New York. Um, and so I figured, like, you know, while I was here, why not organise uh, some stand-up in English? So I got in touch with some people that I know, uh, friends who, who visited Paris uh, and uh, a comedy club that I performed here uh, previously to do some shows in English. And oh my God, what is, what am I doing? Like, it's, <laughs> it's been an experience, ladies and gentlemen, uh, so far. I've got two shows this evening and then two shows tomorrow night as well. Um, but uh, 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 Saturday was the first show. I did, I, did, I did an open mic on Saturday and it was, just, it was horrific. It, I died on my ass in front of about 10 people. It was horrific. It was, it was everything I hoped New York would be in terms of doing English comedy again. I'm starting from the beginning again, right? I'm doing comedy in English. That's my goal, as I've mentioned before, uh, after uh, my bilingual shows now is to do English only and uh, hey, New York, New York hit me with New York, man. It was uh, <laughs> it was in the basement of some bar, uh, like one street away from the Empire State Building, in this underground thing. There was about twenty people uh, in the audience, uh, maybe twenty five. Right, I had three of uh, my friends with me, the, the people organising the French show. Uh, so there was three of them that showed up. Uh, to support me and a Belgian comedian that was also on the show, uh, Siri Nayari, and she was doing uh, the show in English as well as me, the open mic. And so we walked down the stairs and there's like 20 people in this tiny bar. I'm like, oh God, all the comedians are introducing themselves. It's like their second or third time on stage, maybe their first. Speak to the organizer, uh, the host who was great. The host was called Noah um, and I saw him yesterday again as well. And it was just like, it was, I mean, not... <laughs> What transpired was the audience were the friends of the other comedians on the show. So as soon as they performed, the audience left with them, basically. And it was horrific. Ah, oh, by the time I got on stage, I think I was fourth up on the stage. One of the guys before me was like this, the most American man I've seen in a long time. Just like, yeah, America, yeah. And I think he worked in the police or something like that. He brought his like bro friends with him. Yeah, come on, Dennis, let's go. And it was just, it was horrific. It, like the people before me died on their ass. And as they left the stage, then their friends started leaving with them. So I ended up performing in front of 10 people and it was shit. It was so shit. I just wasn't able to, I wasn't able to figure my, my thing out. I think I was so, um, um, what's the word? I was so flustered by the by what was happening. I, I haven't done an open mic like that in about 10 years. Um, and in France, we don't even have open mic shows like that, where like the audience leave during the show and they were all fucking drunk as well. These, these guys, the three guys that were mates with the guy that went on before me, right? The guy was called Dennis. He's like, yeah. Uh, uh, and it, I, don't, if, I don't even remember what he was talking about because I was preparing myself. And as soon as he got off stage, I started, trying to do my set in front of 10 people, the others that remained. And then him and his mates were making a load of noise. And so I had to stop halfway through and be like, guys, what the fuck? Either you leave or you stay. I don't know what's going on. And then the organizer starts shouting at me being like, Paul, keep going. <laughs> and it was, it was just horrific. Like, what am I doing here? Why am I putting myself through this? 
Oh God. So that was show number one. Show number two on Saturday, I went to another, I went to a friend of mine called Brendan who I met in Paris about 10 years ago, who does his own show. Uh, he puts together a show uh, on the, in the, in, oh, by the way, the three friends that I had that came to the show, uh, the French crew, uh, they had decided, because uh, I was in my hotel all day preparing for the show, they had decided to, to get some uh, uh, weed gummies, some THC gummy bears, um, and took them about three hours before the show, and they came, they were fucked coming into the show. They were out, they were just completely <laughs> fucking stoned in just like, ah -ha, ah -ha. I took an amazing photo of them just like eating burgers during the show and just, first of all, they don't speak French, uh, English. Second of all, they were complete, they were higher than I've ever seen anyone. And third, they were just, I'm like, oh, thanks for the support guys. Yeah, fucking well done. Um, I tell you what though, Cyrine Ayari, Belgian, she crushed it. She had a, she, she nailed it. She absolutely nailed it. I was like, oh, okay. I guess I was too nervous. I don't know. I don't know what was going on. Um, anyway, my mate Brendan has a show in a weed shop. That's why I was thinking it's like a weed shop in uh, New York called Sunflower Lounge. And you go down the stairs and this decor is like a, an 80s gaming thing with an arcade backdrop. It's great. If you go on Instagram and you see Sunflower Lounge Comedy, I think it is. The photos look great. The room is great. The ambiance was amazing. There was only about 40 people at the show because it only holds about 40 people. Uh, but the show went great. The show was fun. Uh, I did like 10 minutes uh, and or just a bit, yeah, just under 10 minutes and uh, it was all right. It went a lot better than the first show, so that was reassuring. Um, and we hung out a bit afterwards and then yesterday I did two shows at the same comedy club and it was, the shows were empty. It's Sunday, it was minus five yesterday or whatever that is in Fahrenheit and uh, the, the, it, the room was like one third full and it went okay. I didn't, die on my ass, but it's difficult not to die on your ass in front of 30 people. I was like, oh God, what am I doing? Um, so yeah, I've got, I'm doing that same comedy club tonight and again tomorrow, uh, just to, just, just for the fun of it. What, I'll put myself through it, do you know what I mean? Oh, going from 4,200 people in Paris to 27 in a basement in New York. It's, where, it's what dreams are made of, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, uh, <laughs> God, uh, Dorian roars the gummy story is priceless. I tell you what, they didn't even come out of it until yesterday. It took them 24 hours to get over it. And it turned out that they just overdosed on it because you're supposed to take like 2.5 milligrams if you're starting out of THC in these like gummies, right? And I think that they had like one each, which was like 50 milligrams. So <laughs> about 20 times what they should have had. Um, so that's why they were completely out of it. I didn't hear from any of them until about 2 p.m. yesterday. Oh, it was hilarious. Um, I didn't even get to debrief with them because then they, I had to run to the next show and they were just completely out of it. New York, hey, we love it. Um, so, uh, do you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> oh, God. Uh, Bratis, Bratis Labat, did you ever try weed? I did, yeah, uh, but not in gummy form. Um, I, I, I just hear some shit about the, like the edible stuff where it just, it, it, it hits you about four, four hours later. Um, and then when it does hit you, the story, the amount of stories I've heard from people where they try a bit of like the edible stuff and then nothing happens. So they try a bit more and like, well, still nothing's happening. And they re don't realize it takes like an hour to kick in. And then once it all kicks in, they're fucked. That's what happened to the French crew. Hey, oh God. Please, where is tomorrow's show? I'm not telling you. I don't want you coming to the shows. Um, I don't want you uh, supporting me. I don't want you uh, uh, coming to the show. It's just, it'll make it worse for me. I just want to be on my own and dying on my ass on my own. Uh, Adam Crosby's in the house. There he is. Uh, he says, Faro vibes. Yeah, Faro Portugal. Yeah, I mean, the good news, Adam, uh, is that it was only for seven minutes, you know? I'm only dying on my ass for seven minutes. Uh, I, but like, listen, it's, I think it's, it's down to a bunch of things. I think it's part of the, part of the problem is I'm in an empty room. Uh, also, the other problem is I feel like shit because like the, the comedy scene in New York is so difficult and I've just showed up and been like, hey, can I get a slot? And they're like, yeah, sure, why not? And in talking with some of the other comedians, it's, I mean, half of the comedians that I've seen are just not happy 
to be there. They're just, they're just like, for fuck's sake, let's do the comedy show. Is this comedy? Fuck me. Do I have to be funny? Oh, come on. Um, and the other half are sort of excited and new and starting out, right? So it's kind of a, an interesting vibe. But yeah, New York, there's so many... The, I, it, I was surprised because the comedians were saying hello to each other, like meeting each other. They'd never met before. And this happens apparently on like every night here. Comedians don't know each other because there are so many uh, in New York. When I was looking up um, open mic nights to do in New York, there's a website that has them all listed. And there are about 40 open mic nights per night. It's not even per night, it's per day. Like they start at 12 p.m., and it goes to like 11 p.m. and there's about 40 that you can choose from per day. Um, so no wonder they don't know each other. So yeah, it's been, um, it's been, uh, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know, I, it's, oh, ambulance. Um, it's adding no value to my comedic life apart from depressing me, if I'm honest with you. <laughs> Uh, Imperial Measure, have you checked out Matteo Lane while you're there? I don't know if he does any stand-up in French, but I've seen him use French in audience interactions. Uh, I have not seen Matteo Lane, uh, but uh, I really enjoy uh, what he does, the stuff that he puts out online. If you don't know Matteo Lane, he's a like an American-Italian comedian uh, who posts clips often of him at the Comedy Cellar uh, doing crowd work. He's filmed a couple of his specials at that venue. Um, Oh, by the way, uh, we went to the Comedy Cellar, I think, on Friday night. Uh, and uh, I ended up seeing a friend of mine called uh, Francesco Di Carlo, who is Italian. Uh, and he's got a Netflix show uh, on uh, Netflix Italy, but it's available worldwide. It's in Italian. And uh, I saw him getting on stage uh, at the Comedy Cellar, uh, like their second location in New York, which was amazing. It just completely random. Uh, because he was in my uh, TV series, Stereo Trip, where I travel around the world discovering stereotypes um, uh, and if they're true or not. And he was in the Italian episode in Italy in Rome. And that was also there filmed with uh, Felix Guimard, my director uh, friend, who was also here in New York with us filming some of the behind the scenes. So it was fun for both of us to see him on stage. It's like, what the hell is going on? This is crazy. Um, so uh, yeah, no, I've not seen Matteo. Uh, I went to the Comedy Cellar once. I want to go again to just watch good comedy as opposed to me performing shit comedy. Uh, so, um, yeah, you know. Um, Paul, is there a venue like the Panam Art Cafe where we have here? Yeah, Dorian, there's about 50 of them um, in, uh, in New York. There's loads of them. Uh, I mean, the Panam in France, in Paris, is like a proper comedy club now. So uh, it's, it's, you know, they've got comedy shows all day, every day. All day, every day. All evening, every day. Uh, and then it doubles as a restaurant. Uh, so yeah, and I mean, there's, the, I mean, there's a, a bunch here. There's the New York, I think it's called the New York Comedy Club. Uh, there's the Gotham Comedy Club. There's the Comedy Cellar, uh, the Broadway Comedy Club. Uh, there's a whole bunch of comedy clubs in New York uh, that I should have tried to go and watch the shows. It's impossible to get on the shows. I was talking to a guy last night, one of the comedians who was on my show, and he was saying that the New York, I think it's the New York Comedy Club, um, he, they run a course which is like how to level up in comedy. This guy's been doing comedy since 2018. Uh, so uh, he's just started, but he's fucking hilarious. Because um, you have to be in New York. If you want to get anywhere, you've just got to be funny. Uh, whereas in France, I've been lucky enough to get to where I've gotten to by not being funny. Um, and so he was saying that he did like a, a comedy course at that comedy club called Level Up or something like that. And he was speaking to the, to the person uh, about how to get a show, how he could get like seven minutes on at the New York Comedy Club, like the actual shows on a, you know, booked on the shows. And he was like, well, basically, uh, there's like an audition process. Uh, you have to send in a tape uh, and then you have to audition for them or something like that. And then once you audition for them, then you have to wait. There's like a two year wait to get on the actual show because that's how many people are doing comedy in New York. So <laughs> I don't fit in at all. Uh, Florian, uh, beau fruton, Florian beau fruton, um, Hello mate, are you vlogging this whole experience? I kind of am, but not really in the sense that um, I was speaking to Felix. Felix Guimard. Felix Navidad. Um, 
and he found it interesting to maybe document some of me starting my comedy life again in English. I've been wanting to do this, but I just can't pay anyone to come and film me all the time. So I've been talking to my phone uh, a little bit and debriefing some of the uh, experiences a little bit and filming a little bit, little bits and pieces. Not enough, because maybe, I don't know, in two years when I actually realise, uh, or when I've actually written some funny stuff that English speakers will find funny, uh, then uh, it will be funny to watch all of it back and just see the places that I started performing in New York. It feels like 10 years ago because I've already done some open mics in the UK, uh, in the US. And yeah, they're shit. But you've got to start. You, just, you, have to, you, you have to be there, right? And as Mushroom Nerd says, I'm living the American dream. Anyone can make it. Uh, yeah, I am. Here's the other thing, though. It's like the reason why it feels a little bit pointless uh, doing comedy in English in New York is that I'm not trying to become a comedian in New York because if I was I'd have to move here and be here every day and be on stage every day and that's how you 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 can't just jump in like halfway through I say that Gad Elmaleh uh, jumped in uh, at a pretty high level just because Jerry Seinfeld's his best mate so it yeah it, it is possible if you've got the right connections but yeah I, I don't know I'm not trying to make random New Yorkers laugh in my career. I don't think I am. Maybe I am. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. Anyway, it's been, um, it's been, uh, <laughs> it's been, it's been fun so far. Um, all right. Can I yell for fun? Um, the SNL thing. Uh, yes, let's do it. Since I'm in New York, we might as what do, what do they shout? What's the Saturday Night Live thing? They go live from New York. It's Monday night, maybe. It's Monday night. It's what do they say? Live from New York. It's Saturday night. Whatever. There you go. Live from New York. <laughs> it's Monday night. Live live from New York. It's Monday afternoon. Oh, God. Um. Whoo. Um. Oh, tu peux tenter d'ouvrir un resto de croisé à New York. Oh, that is a specific reference at Cavallino uh, over the weekend in France. If you don't have, if you didn't see, you don't watch TV, which probably you may, you might not. I was on a cooking show on France 3 called Cuisine Ouverte. Uh, and uh, it was, it was, it, 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 we filmed it about nine months ago uh, in a place where I almost, I used to live 10 minutes down the road in a, uh, uh, near Tonon les Bains, Evian les Bains when I was a kid and they made me go back there and uh, we did a, it was a cooking show and I did a recipe with uh, one of the, the chef who, who, what's his name, uh, Mori, is it? Uh, who hosts the show. I think he was in Top Chef or Master Chef or something like that. Now he hosts his own cooking show and every episode, it's really fun actually, every episode he goes to a different region and then finds like the local ingredient, whatever that is, and then turns that uh, into uh, a different dish. And so uh, les crozets, uh, which is uh, their, their little like lozenge shaped, uh, sort of like pasta from that region of France. He turned it into a yakisoba Japanese thing. So you can watch it. If you live in France or you've got a VPN, um, then you can uh, go on France 3's website and re-watch it uh, if you want. Um, it was fun. I enjoyed it. It was, um, yeah, it was, it was it, it, I mean, it wasn't hilarious. But it was, I don't know, it's just, I'm just awkward. I'm just, just realising I am an awkward person. Um, and uh, I manage to hide it very well when I'm on stage. Sometimes. When I'm on stage in front of many people, I can hide it well. If I'm on stage in front of 10 people, it's horrific. And if I'm on a TV show with one other person, but with five people pointing cameras at me, I'm even more awkward. Um, <laughs> uh, his name is Maurice Sacco. Yes, that is him. Um, uh, re it's really nice guy, really nice guy. So, um, <laughs> DPJ Biss, are you related to Michael Taylor who lived in New York? Mate, <laughs> you mean there's only one, you think there's only one Michael Taylor that lived in New York? <laughs> I reckon there's probably about 300, at least, Michael Taylors that lived in New York. Uh, if I Google right now, my oh, I don't want to Google, I can't do that because otherwise... My camera's going to switch itself off. Ah. Um, tu as l'air tellement moins fatigué à New York qu'en France, vraiment. Ah bon? Parce que moi, je suis éclaté. Uh, I seem less tired than I do in France. Well, also, it's not 9 p.m. 
and I'm not at the end of my garden um, uh, after having dinner with my wife and child, right? So, uh, but I feel way more tired because uh, I haven't been sleeping well. Uh, jet lag, mixture of, or it just, yeah, uh, I feel way more tired uh, than, than I, I don't know what it is with the jet lag. Also, I wasn't sleeping here the whole time. I was in, a, in an apartment um, in Brooklyn for the first two nights of my stay uh, in an apartment that was cold, that had no heating, um, and that were, there were works happening. They were redoing the fucking building. So at 9 a.m. or 8 a.m., whatever, so they, they started fucking building works. Oh, it's horrific. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, I moved myself to a hotel. Uh, Greg Crozier's in the house. Legend, world champion skydiver. Uh, Englishman in New York. Hello, Greg Crozier. How are you, my friend? Um, good to see ya. Good to see ya. Um, uh, Michel Luna, but aren't all English people awkward? Do you think English stand-up comedians have the same problem as you? Yeah, a lot of English people are awkward socially. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of comedians... There was a girl yesterday who was on stage before me. Uh, I say a girl, a woman. Uh, she was probably about my age. And... We, ba we she didn't even make eye contact with me for the entire evening. Well, we didn't, she, like, she was on the stage before me and as she came off the stage uh, and I was going to go up in when the host was on stage, I, like, I wanted to say, like, great set or whatever. And she just looked away as she walked past me. It was, she, I mean, she's fucking awkward as well. Everyone's awkward. Um, I think just people hide it better than others. Like, where was I, what was I doing today that I felt awkward? Um... I went to Starbucks. Of course I went to Starbucks, opposite where they filmed The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. There's a Starbucks just across the street. And no, it wasn't, there was something else that was, oh, I'll tell you what it was. It was the swimming pool of the hotel. Um, Cause I got a hotel with a swimming pool. Cause I thought, ah, oh, at least I'll relax a bit. And it just, it, I'm just so fucking awkward. I don't know if I show up in my dressing gown. Do I show up? Uh, in my normal clothes and get changed? Is there a changing room? How do you get in there? What's the etiquette? Are you allowed? It just, oh God, I fucking hate like spas, massages and swimming pools. Once I'm in there, it's kind of all right. Um, and then I kind of get you, but it's just, oh. Also, there's no one in the hotel. So um, it's dead. So there's like three people in the swimming pool, which means it's, I think if it was empty, I'd be fine. If there was 300 people there, I'd be fine. It's when there's like a, a, a small amount of people that you can look in the eyes of each individual person. I, I lose my mind. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, it's called imposter syndrome, says Mahad Ahamani. But don't worry, Paulie T, you'll be all right. I know, I'll be all right. I know. Um, but <laughs> why can't you go to Pret? pret a -Manger, like a proper Brit. Just because Starbucks was the first thing that, that, that it was on the way to my camera shop where I was buying my light uh, to stick on top of my phone. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Misha Luna, do you plan on going to a late night show while you're here? Um, no, because you can't. It's, they're all fully booked like months in advance. So uh, I would have loved to sit in the audience for one of the tapings of uh, like a Jimmy Fallon or Stephen Colbert. Or what else did they film here? Late Night with Seth Meyers. I don't know if it's Late Night with Seth, it's the, whatever the Seth Meyers, the, it's either Late Night, Tonight, the SNL as well, Saturday Night Live is filmed here. Live from New York, it's Saturday night. Um, what else? I feel like there's a couple of others. John Oliver, um, Last Week Tonight. There's a bunch of them that filmed in New York, but it, 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 it's just, it's, it is fully booked. Eh. And I don't know anyone. Um, so I would have loved to. I really would have loved to. Uh, also, uh, I, I would have loved... I'm gonna, I need to go to more comedy nights that I can watch. So I'm performing twice tonight, 7pm, 9pm. Um, so I might try and go to the comedy cellar like late night, like 11pm or something, and just be in the audience with five people. Uh, <laughs> and watch comedians uh, try and perform in front of five people. What am I doing here? Oh, God. Uh, Alec Van Rel, how long are you in New York? Just until Wednesday. I'm back home on Thursday. I leave on Wednesday. I land on Thursday. Uh, and then I'm back in Paris for a few weeks. And then I go on holiday with my wife and daughter um, to uh, Thailand for two weeks, which is uh, super fun. We've been waiting almost a year 
to go because we were supposed to go uh, to Thailand two weeks before my show in Bangkok in May. And we were in the process of moving house and it was complicated and we just couldn't, we had to postpone it until the school holidays uh, in February. So uh, my wife, my daughter, and I uh, are going to Thailand uh, to, to, to laze around on a beach for two weeks. Uh, I say laze around. Well, maybe, hopefully, hopefully, because the problem is it's a hotel. And so it means similar to this, uh, there is no other room for my daughter, daughter to sleep in. Uh, so uh, she's gonna be sleeping in our room in a bed. Like, so we're gonna hear her snoring because she snores. Uh, and uh, we're not going to get much sleep, but during the day, hopefully, she'll enjoy the kids' club because uh, they have a kids' club, I think. Um, and so, hopefully, she can go and play with some other kids, speak a bit of English, English. Um, and my wife and I can lay on, uh, lay on the beach. Lay I don't even, I fucking hate the beach. I don't even know why I'm going. Um, there'll just be some cocktails. I think, I think, I hope they've got a pool with a cocktail bar in the pool that you can drink your cocktail at the bar in the pool. That would be my fucking dream. Um, so we'll see. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, if you need camera gear, go to the B&H. It's huge. That's where I went, Krista S. I went to the B&H, um, the legendary photo uh, shop, f photo store. That was a, I was awkward in that place as well. I just wanted one of these lights, like a tiny little light uh, that I could uh, stick on top of my phone to, 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 to shine some light in my face. Because uh, if it's if the, if there isn't, I'll take uh, look, I'll show you what happens if the light is off, right? That that is what I would have looked like. I mean, it's still. It, it, I mean, it, to be fair, it's acceptable. Uh, but I bought one of these little small uh, lights uh, to stick on top of my phone, and I was awkward in that store. Like I didn't know, like they don't have the stuff on the shelf like they do in Fnac in France or Darty. So you have to, I, I, I was looking for it on the shelf, I couldn't find it, and then it was like, oh, I went up to a guy, excuse me, can, I'm looking for this Aperture MC light, like, can you, is it, and the guy was like super friendly, it's just that initial, con you're just, oh God, does anyone, is it just me? Or is anyone else like that? Where you just don't, if you don't know how things work, you get all panicky about like, I don't know, it's whatever it is, social anxiety, I don't know, oh God. Um, Virino would say a roux à la plage, uh, Patrick Schnewelli. Um, yeah, except I'm not ginger, so that doesn't work. Oh, God. Um. <laughs> Do people recognise you a lot on the street? Funnily enough, I was uh, in Times Square with Felix, um, who was, we were doing some video for the Frenchy Comedy Club that uh, we did on Friday. And because um, I'm hosting the show, we wanted to do a bit of video. So we were in Times Square and I, he was filming me and I just went, hey, whatever, bienvenue au Frenchy Comedy Club à New York, blah, 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 did the promo. Uh, finished recording and then a couple came up and they were like, oh, Paul Taylor, can we grab a photo? Uh, and she was from Colombia and uh, her husband was from Luxembourg and they weren't even coming to the show. They were leaving that evening, uh, like a few hours later. So yeah, that was amazing. Uh, so I do have people randomly come up in the street. Not, not, not so much in New York, unless I'm in Times Square or somewhere where there are French people. Because uh, French people are everywhere. And the French people who are abroad uh, tend to recognize me more than the French people at home. Uh, you know, because I'm a foreigner in France. So when the French people go to a foreign place, you know, they kind of identify with me uh, in a different way than the people of Saint-Pierre-sur-Dive. Do you know what I mean? Um, ta -ta -ta. Raquel is panicky on the phone. Yeah, man, I fucking hate phone calls. I hate calling up like customer service people because I'm just worried I'm never going to understand what they're saying. That's the main issue. It, not because they're foreign, but because of the sound quality. And it's like the same thing, like people leave me voicemails and I can't understand what they're saying. And I'm just like, oh, I just, I just get this like, this a, a thing of just like, yeah, I, I know I shouldn't give a shit, but for some reason I do. Um, uh, what else is going on? Maybe it's awkward because in the US people are too nice and you're no longer used to that. <laughs> Oh God, yeah, it is true that people here are, are friendlier. Uh, well, I say that in New York, uh, 
well, even in New York, they're nicer. It's funny because New York has a reputation uh, amongst the US, amongst Americans, that everyone's an asshole here. I'm like, yeah, have you been to Paris? Uh, and it's just the big city syndrome, right? If you live in a big city uh, with massive skyscrapers and everyone's living on top of each other, um, then you just get angry with everyone. New York, the difference with New York and Paris is New York is bigger than Paris. The streets are calmer. Uh, there is way more space on the pavement, on the sidewalk. The streets are bigger. There's more breathing space, whereas Paris is like claustrophobic even more than New York. Um, and so people are even angrier in Paris. I don't think I've been to a, a big city as angry as Paris. Uh, in second place, New York, maybe London. That, I mean, just people are, are not. But I feel like there's a there's a, a what do you call it um, a a sense of camaraderie uh, in in New York or London. Like everyone's in the shit together, right? And everyone still manages to be polite. Let people through uh, on the on the metro, on the underground, on the subway. I don't know. Just people feel more <laughs> more cordial. That's the word I was looking for. Oh God. Um, how do you recognize French people on holidays? Drop some stereotypes. Oh God, that's a good question. When they're speaking, I don't have, I don't, I, it's usually they're wearing a scarf when it isn't scarf weather. Uh, that is number one. Number two, they're wearing dark clothes that are really skinny fit, like they fit really well. Um, that's usually, the fashion is a giveaway. It's the same thing when you spot an American from a mile off, right? With their baggy hoodie from a university that they haven't been to. Um, and uh, like trainers or sneakers that don't match the, with white socks or something. Like it's just <laughs> overly baggy jeans um, and maybe a baseball cap. Uh, you can spot Americans a mile off. English, I feel like English people uh, dress a bit, maybe a bit more, it, they're still in like the European type of uh, fitting of the clothes, uh, but a bit more, maybe a bit more eccentric, a bit more colours. Um, also, way too much makeup. Uh, I was in the supermarket just buying this. It wasn't, it was a convenience store. It wasn't a supermarket uh, that sold everything. They sold vape pens. They sold uh, 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 Advil uh, for my headache, uh, whatever. Anyway, and in there, uh, just behind me, I wasn't facing them, but I could hear some English girls being like, oh, excuse me, is this one I can get uh, some Advil? Uh, yeah, just a normal one. It'd be fantastic, please. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, and as I turned around, I looked at them. I'm like, of course, that's what they looked like. They <laughs> just so, too much makeup. I don't know what it is with English girls. They're too much makeup. Um, it's a fashion thing. I don't know. I don't know if there's a TV show uh, where it became f fashionable to have too much makeup. If you, it's weird. I don't understand. Um, it's just like American men, right? The, the, without the, not the makeup, but you can see American men. I feel like American women don't stand out as much as American men do on, if I see them on holiday, right? I go, oh, that's definitely an American couple, but I see the guy before I see the women. In English, like English men don't stand out as much for me as, as English women. It's weird, I don't know. Um, Paris's motto is ta gueule putain. <laughs> yeah, or oh, tu me fais chier. Um, oh God. Uh, 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 um, what else is going on? What else is going on? Uh, Americans have hoodies, British have jumpers. Yeah, that's true. We do wear quite a lot of jumpers in England. Um, I say this as I'm wearing a jumper, but I'm quite hot, so I might have to take it off in a bit. But uh, my microphone's stuck to it. Maybe I should turn the air conditioning on. Uh, let's turn it down. Air conditioning. Oh, les Français. Oh, l'air conditionné. Uh, uh, je vais tomber malade. Uh. <laughs> 18.5 degrees, is that as low as it goes? All right, well. Um, about relations between the US and the UK, have you ever seen the, the TV series Ted Lasso? Yeah, I love it, uh, Ted Lasso. Here's the interesting thing, I don't know if anyone else does this. Does anyone else start TV shows, really enjoy them and then just never finish them, even though you really enjoy them? I and my wife are the kings and queens of doing that. We started Ted Lasso, I think we got to series three, maybe. And we just haven't watched it. And I, if you give me any TV show, just drop the names of TV shows in the comments right now and I'll let you know. I guarantee, I, I, 
Oh, I can tell you. The only one I finished is Lost. That is the only TV show that I've ever finished. And Friends. But I didn't start Friends. Do you know what I mean? Like, I didn't watch Friends from the beginning and then do the 10 years. Like, I started watching it maybe from Series 7. I don't remember. It was too long ago. Uh, but I did, I did watch the, end, the last episode of Friends. Uh, but I wasn't following it, you know, on English TV. It wasn't like, oh, I need to make sure I tune in every week. Um, so, uh... Da, da, da. Go fucking watch the end of Ted Lasso. If they, is it finished? Has it, has it gotten to the end? I think that's why I don't do it. It's because there's, n- it, there's no end in sight uh, for certain things. Um, shameless. Never watched it. Um, but da, 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 da. So is Paul Jamie Tart or Roy Kent? I think I'm more Roy Kent because I, I, like I like him more. I just like the way he just goes, Are you fucking Kent? <laughs> Whatever he says is great. I love it. I love how angry he is. Shit's Creek, never watched it. Sense8, never watched it. Um, uh, TV show about Seinfeld, no, nope, never watched it. Uh, Black Mirror, okay. Again, Black Mirror is one of those. I haven't uh, seen the late... I've seen the first episode of the latest season. And that's it. Um, Chef's Table, never watched it. Uh, Master of None, uh, I watched maybe one season and a bit. Just didn't, um, yeah, Dawson, Malcolm, same thing. Dawson, I, it was on TV, so I watched it. Malcolm in the middle, watched it a little bit, but, you know, never started or finished it. Yeah, it's, it's weird, isn't it? The Crown, same story with the fucking Crown. We watched it until whatever season... I don't even know what season we finished it. We have... Mm, I don't know. I think it was season four that we, because it was two seasons with one queen, two seasons with another queen, and that's, I think, as far as we got. Are we on six? Suits, same thing. I fucking loved Suits, uh, and so did my wife, because she used to be a lawyer before she worked with me. Same thing. We got to, basically, the season before Meghan left, Meghan Markle, uh, and I think Harvey Specter left as well, did he? I don't know. We were just like, uh, whatever. Uh, and I'm sure we could watch it again. Breaking Bad, I watched one episode. Yeah. Better Call Saul, never watched it. Yeah, there you go. I don't know. I don't know what it is with TV shows. Um, Andreas says, Has it already happened to you uh, that your daughter speaks English to French kids? No, absolutely not. Uh, but it, what, what has happened is she speaks French to English kids. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't speak English, uh, my daughter. Uh, she speaks a bit of English to my mum, uh, but it's uh, nowhere near her level of French. And that's normal. It's because mum... It, what's weird... So here's the thing. I found a woman on TikTok uh, who films her daughter, and her daughter is in the same situation as my daughter, about the same age as well, pretty much exactly the same age. French-British, but in this case, the woman is English, and the dad is... Um, French and you can really tell the difference of it really depends on what language that's why they call it the mother tongue that's why it's called the mother tongue right because you learn your language from your mum mostly it traditionally as well uh you know before women were allowed to work now of course that can change uh but in the stereotypical couple uh, that my wife and I are in uh, I am more often not at home uh, and my wife is at home because she works from home and I work from places like New York. Um, so, yeah, whereas this woman on TikTok, the girl, and she looks a lot like my daughter as well. It's pretty scary. Uh, and I just found one of her videos. It popped up in, the, in my uh, For You page. And her daughter speaks better English than French. Uh, and it's because mum is English and because dad is English in my case and I'm never there. Uh, then her level of English is shit. Uh, for now, for now, for now, which is why uh, I'm excited to go uh, on holiday to Thailand and she can go to the kids club. I want to bring them here. Like it would be cool to come to New York for like two, three weeks, do like comedy nights everywhere here uh, and uh, in the evening and then during the day, hang out with the family. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a whole, and like it's so, I was walking down the street to uh, Times Square today just after to get my camera thing. And um, there's so much stuff for kids, the m M&M store, there was a big poster for Paw Patrol, uh, Krispy Kreme. Oh, it's just, it's, it's a kid's paradise. I, I can imagine them just looking there going, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, so yeah, it would be fun to bring them both here uh, for a couple of weeks. Do you know what I mean? 
Um, when you inevitably move to Montreal, she'll learn English. <laughs> oh, God. And Tehimara, if you watch location, 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 you know, you'd know that dressing is indeed an English word that means walking wardrobe. No, it doesn't. It doesn't exist in English as the walk-in wardrobe. I mean, the English word is walking, walk-in wardrobe, not a walk-in, <laughs> a walking wardrobe. Ah, a wardrobe that has feet that actually walks. Yeah, dressing. I know that dressing is an English word, but it means salad. It's what you put on a salad, salad dressing. Uh, you can have a dressing room. Uh, what else? What was the other thing? There was uh, uh, a dressing. Uh, I feel like there's another word. Or oh, I am dressing. I'm, I'm dressing up tonight to go out uh, to the theatre. Uh, it's a verb, right, as well. To dress. Uh, but uh, it, it, yeah, it's th that, that's my complaint. That's my whole series about the Anglicisms uh, that uh, I will start again, ladies and gentlemen. I've got about 40 more episodes uh, in the bank uh, to be able to uh, write and uh, produce of these if you want some more. Um, is uh, complaining that the French people invent English words or they misuse English words. Um, that's it. Uh, <laughs> da, da, da. Uh, Anne Roberts, j'ai grandi dans une famille trilingue et la langue que je parle le mieux, c'est le français, langue parlée avec ma maman. Donc oui, je confirme. There we go. Yeah, trilingual family. Um, and the language that you speak the best is français, uh, which is uh, what you spoke with your mum. Yeah, it's... Uh, they'll, they'll cancel the term mother tongue at some point because that will become sexist. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's still a, a reality uh, until, you know, uh, things equal out eventually. And then, uh, I don't know what they'll call it, uh, parent tongue? <laughs> um, yeah. Do you know? Uh, Pokraz Roy says, yes, we want it. Well, and clearly people do as well, because uh, those videos uh, have done really well uh, on Instagram and TikTok and uh, YouTube. YouTube. Are you the only one from your family to speak French? No, my dad speaks uh, French, Andreas. Uh, he speaks uh, French. Mais avec l'accent britannique, très sexy, sexy, bonjour. But I'm not saying that my dad is sexy. What I'm saying is he's got the sexy accent. All right, calm it down, Andreas. Um, so yeah, he speaks French and that's it. Just me and my dad. Um, and my daughter and my wife, because technically they're my family. <laughs> uh, I know what you meant though. Uh, Maher Ahamane, speaking of language, should we do some terrible translations? I would love to do some terrible translations, but I can't because they're on my phone, which is filming me. Uh, so we'll have to wait until next week um, uh, to do some more terrible translations. Those of you who are new uh, to Monday Night Live, uh, the podcast, uh, I, I enjoy terrible translations. They make me laugh um, and they make you laugh apparently as well. So you send them to me and then we talk about them uh, during the show. Uh, but since I'm not doing them today, then uh, uh, we're not. Um, so yeah, because I cannot, uh, I, I need another phone now. now. I need two, right, that's what I need. I need to buy another phone so that when I'm traveling, which is once, not very often anymore, uh, then I can read the emails. I could do it on my computer, but then I'm gonna lose you guys. The camera's gonna switch, it's, it's too complicated. It's too technically complicated. I'm gonna stop doing technically complicated shit. I'm tired of it. Um, <laughs> uh, um, Native language, yeah. I mean, people say native language, don't they? Obviously, native language, yeah. But that'll become, that'll become cancelled as well because you, it, it, Native Americans, they're like, oh, you can't say that anymore. It just, it, words change. I love how j the sound that comes out of your mouth, because all the, all, you're, you understand what I'm saying, but it, in reality, it's just sound waves. I find it strange how we it, attach emotional, um, you know, people who get angry that I swear too much. I find it hilarious that people get angry about sound waves coming out of the vocal cords in you. Because if it's a foreign person speaking, you don't understand anything they're saying. And it's just sounds that come out. Do you know, it's really interesting. I love it. So anyway, um, somebody, one of the comedians the other day was talking about... Um, if, as a lot of New York comedians who are male talk about, is sex. Um, and he was talking about uh, an, an STD and somebody in the audience shouted out, it's STI! And there was a discussion between them both. Apparently STD is offensive and it carries more stigma than STI. And so when I got on stage, 
I was like, guys, guys, New York, I am just so happy to be performing in front of an audience that actually speaks English. Because you guys are debating the difference between infection and disease, right? Whereas when I'm performing comedy in English in France, I basically have to speak like a foreigner for them to understand what I'm saying. It got some good laughs. Uh, so, yeah, hilarious. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. Um, Curtis uh, Cortasi won. Hey, Paul, I'm the American that randomly ran into you in a cafe in Paris last July. How are you liking the US? Listen, mate, there's a lot of random Americans that bump into me in cafes in Paris. I can't remember which cafe it was. How am I liking the US? Listen, I enjoy the US. Uh, every time I come here, I've been here, I don't know, 30, 40 times in my life. Uh, I think it's my sixth or seventh time to New York. Uh, it's always fun leaving Paris, just being in a different place, basically, uh, and being surrounded by I mean, basically the same people, isn't it? Big cities, it's the same people that live in big cities. This is why New York is fun for me, because I'm catching the subway everywhere. It's the same thing, it's the metro. There are mental people on the subway here just being like, motherfucker! And in Paris, it's the same thing. You just have crazy people being like, putain merde! It just sounds maybe more sexy in French. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's super fun. I don't know if I would ever live here just because of how complicated What's weird about New York? Nah, I don't know if it's just New York though. It feels like for such a developed country, there's a whole side of it that's completely undeveloped. We went to a restaurant. Um, I mean, by undeveloped, I mean sketchy. Uh, we went to a restaurant the other day that did cash only. I'm like, cash only? We're in 2024, 20, mate. What is going on? How much money are you laundering from this restaurant? You had to queue outside, you know, and obviously, why, what, what, what is their advantage of doing, why, are they, why is it cash only? It's because they're not declaring half of the money that they're making, let's face it. I'm just like, really? I mean, that, and it's a, like a really famous spot as well. I don't feel like in London or in Paris that happens because you just can't get away with it. It's weird. Everything is contactless here. It's either contactless payments or cash. Like, I don't feel there's any, it's either, and what I mean by contact, I mean like Apple Pay or Samsung Pay or whatever, Google Android Pay, whatever the other team is. Um, I don't see anyone using cards. It's either cash or like the high-tech mobile shit. You know, they, even Metro taking the subway here, I'm beeping my phone. Um, but then there's like cash-only establishments. You're like, what is going on? Like the comedy seller, to get into the comedy seller, you don't, you don't pay an entrance fee. There's, you don't buy a ticket in advance, which is weird. You, you, you reserve for free, so then everything gets sold out and then you have to show up. But then there's a queue outside in minus three degree weather for people who don't. I'm like, why don't you just sell tickets up front? I don't understand. Uh, it's all the fucking money. It's all they got. They are, it's, it's very... Um, uh, there's, there's parts of it that feel very rudimentary, if that makes sense. But I love it. I love the vibe. I don't know if that makes sense at all, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> tout taxi sera à vos frais. <laughs> ah, I love it. Uh, that's a, that's a, a private joke from the last tour uh, that we had uh, here in, in New York. Um, cash only is for tax purposes, uh, as you mentioned. Yeah, I, I feel like there's no other reason uh, why uh, you would. Um, would you ride to Montreal by Amtrak? <laughs> Anton Benedict Tria, I already have. I did that when I was 21. Uh, I, I took the train from Montreal down to New York with my best friend Daniel at the time uh, for his 21st birthday. He came to, I was living in Montreal and it was February and he came to visit me for his birthday in Montreal and we decided to come down uh, to uh, New York by train and uh, oh, it's horrific. I think it was like 12 hours long. The train stops on the border between Canada and the US. The TSA agents get on the train and interview each individual person. Imagine border control at a New York airport, uh, which is horrific. I spent an hour and a half stood up waiting to get through immigration. Imagine that, but on a train. At least you're sitting down, to be fair. Um, so yeah, it was horrific. The downside to that trip Two things. One, there was a snowstorm and we weren't equipped for it. Uh, number two, his 21st birthday was like three days away. 
And so we didn't realize being from a normal country that uh, where you can get into bars when you're 18 years old, that here is 21 years old and he didn't, we, he, we weren't allowed into any bars because he was 21 in three days. It was mental. It was like, what, well, even if I get a fucking Coke Zero? Nah, you're not allowed in. That drives me nuts. That's, that's like the, one of the, like the rules things that you're just like, why is that a rule? I get like not, why don't they just check for ID at the bar? Why, don't you, why are you not allowed into the establishment? And then if you want an alcoholic drink, then, then they ask you for ID, like you do in the UK. You can go into it, but they'll ask you for ID. And then, you, you, in fr I mean, in France, tech, no one asks for ID anyway. They don't give a shit. <laughs> oh. oh, God. Um. Um, what else have we got? What else have we got? Tickets in the US has been a massive problem. Don't you know what happened with Taylor Swift and Ticketmaster? Yes, I do know what happened. Uh, yeah, tickets in the US are outrageous as well. Like tickets for concerts where you pay and then there's like extra fees. Like lots of extra fees. I feel like in Europe, again, there are rules around this. And if you buy a ticket like to one of my shows in Europe, if it's like 35 euros, you might pay one or two euros uh, like um, a service charge or something like that, which I don't, I, well, I don't even know why those exist because you're booking your own tickets. It's not like you're calling somebody up to be like, oh, hi there, I'd like to book a, a ticket to see Paul Taylor, please, on Saturday night at 8 p.m. Um, and then somebody else is doing the work for you so they have to pay that employee. No, you, you're doing it online yourself uh, and you have to do a little puzzle as well. You know, the little, uh, is this how, type, tap on all the crosswalks or the red lights. There's a little challenge involved as well. Uh, and you have to get paid. I mean, I guess they have to have servers and maintain the servers. So you've got to, I mean, but in the US it's outrageous. It's like, it, it can be like, uh, if the tickets are 30 euros, the service charges can be like 15, which is like half of the price. It's outrageous. Again, the US have some great stuff and uh, some weird stuff as well, just like Europe. Do you know what I mean? Um, uh, 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 uh. Bryce Bias just bought tickets for Hamilton, listed at 39 each. Bought two for 130. It's, it's that's another thing. Is when I get in the US that there are different taxes in the different states. But fuck me, can you not just put the price of what it costs, including the taxes, just on the thing? Just make an effort. Do you know what I mean? I remember I'm traumatized from when I was 12 years old. I went on a ski trip to Vermont with the school, and uh, uh, on our way back f uh, from Boston, we we spent like. I don't know, four hours in Boston city center or wherever. And I had like $5 left, a $5 bill. And we were in McDonald's and I, whatever the meal was, it was like four ninety five dollars was the meal. I'm like, great. I took out my $5 bill. And because they then added taxes on top of it, uh, I wasn't able to get my meal. I was fucking furious. I think that's where my, all my anger stems from is that one day in Boston when I got fucked over by the American tax system, it's like, McDonald's, you're a big enough corporation. Put the fucking price in the state that we're currently in on the board. I understand that it changes, but I don't care though. Fucking make an effort. This is why when everyone's like, oh, things are so much cheaper in the US, they're not, right? Especially food in restaurants. Out outrageous. Because not only is the price there, you've got to add taxes on top of that to the final bill and then like 20% tip. So if you've gone out and it's like a hundred dollars, it's like 120. It's like, they, that's a fucking different amount of money. It's outrageous. Anyway. Um, ah, Shirelle, hello, Paul. Uh, love you so much. Well, I love you too, Shirelle. Uh, putting me in a good mood now. <laughs> oh, let's be honest, Boston is way better than New York City. I don't know. Um, I've not been to Boston enough. I went to Boston last time I was there. Uh, I think it was 2014, and I went to the improv. Um, they've got an improv school or show out there. It was unbelievable. It's so good. That's one thing that America is way better at than the whole of Europe combined is entertainment. Jesus Christ. We are shit um, compared to over here. It's great. It was an improv. I can't remember what it was called. 
That's a shame. It's like a famous improv place. It's not the improv and it's not Second City. Uh, I can't remember what it was called. Uh, it was great though. One of the best shows I've ever seen live. Just improv in general. Uh, I love it. You paid uh, 700 euros to see Blink-182 last year. Oh my God. $700, sorry. Woo! I mean, was it worth it though? Was the show good? Because I, I mean, I, 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 I'm a fan of Blink-182, but I don't think I'd have paid that much to go and see them. Um, <sighs> wow, you must have gone to a great school if you went to trips to the US. Yeah, it was a, I, I went to a school for a couple of years um, called, I can't remember what it was called. What was it called? Kent College? Was it Kent College in Canterbury? It's like a, uh, yeah, school, like for two, three years. It was, a, it was a good school. I think it was like, they, they I think we had to pay like 800 pounds though to go on this ski trip. I don't know why I remember that. Um, it was a fun trip though, for a week. Fucking love skiing. I'm not going to go this year again. Ah, oh, ah. It was absolutely worth the 700. It was only for my husband and I. It was only, what you mean the gig was only for you? You mean Blink-182 performed just for you and your husband? In which case, you got a fucking bargain for $700. What are you complaining about? <laughs> ah. Oh God. I have to give one of my kidneys to see Louis CK. Yeah, I imagine he's quite expensive. Speaking of Louis CK, uh, funny video that my wife sent me yesterday. So, uh, you know, for the past uh, week or so before coming to New York, uh, you know, I was telling Louise and my wife was telling Louise that I was going to New York. Daddy's going to New York for a couple of years. She's like, oh, New Yorker. And there's a, a, a film, I can't remember the name of it, and it's based in New York and it has animals in it. Secret Life of Pets, is that the name of it? I think it's The Secret Life of Pets, where the main character is voiced by Louis C.K. And uh, my wife sent me a video uh, of the credits at the end, because when the credits came up on the TV, uh, my daughter Louise was like, mais c'est presque mon nom, because she knows how to read her name. So she was like, ah, oh, it's almost my name. And it was the, when it said Louis C.K. Uh, on the TV, and she was smart enough to realize that was almost her name. It was amazing. Um, there you go, Louis C.K. Oh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, T'as déjà été à des matchs d'impro en France, Yann C. I have done, um, im, uh, I've not done them, but I went to go see an improv group called Colors in France, in Paris one time, at Le Théâtre du Gymnase, I think. And the guest on the show, the, the idea is that there's a different person wearing a different coloured shirt. And the person in the white shirt is a guest. I don't know if they still exist, if this show still exists, but at the time, the uh, show, the guest was Baptiste Le Caplain. It was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. He was so good at improvising, um, something which I'm not good at. So I, I would love to, I mean, I, maybe I should do some improv classes. It would just make me a, be a better comedian, eh, do you know? Um, so yeah, mate, all right, all right, all right. The film in France is called Come de Bête. Um, all right, Come de Bête. Yeah, The Secret Life of Pets. The Secret Life of Pets? I don't know. I can't remember. It's something, or maybe it's pet. I do, it doesn't matter. It, no one cares anymore. Uh. <laughs> uh. Um. Uh, JB007, T'en penses quoi du S24 Ultra en titane? I don't know. I presume that's a, a Galaxy, a Samsung Galaxy S24. Is that a Samsung phone? Have they done titanium as well? Uh, just like uh, Apple have. I, it's, it's hilarious, isn't it? Apple and Samsung just copying each other all the way and Google with the operating system. feel like Apple does... Uh, I feel like Apple copies the software features of uh, Samsung's and Google uh, Android. And then uh, Google and Samsung copy the hardware features of the iPhone. It's, it's hilarious. And because they're released six months apart from each other, Here's the thing though, I say they're released six months apart from each other, they are, but they clearly know what each other is doing because uh, th th they don't make a phone in a year. It takes years of research and development to come up with a new design, whether it's software or hardware. So they clearly know what each other are doing. And it's not like Samsung saw the iPhone come out in September 
in titanium and go, shit, we need to make a titanium phone, they wouldn't have had time to develop it and put it on sale uh, by now. Impossible. So they already knew. I guess there were rumors that the iPhone was going to be titanium for way before. I don't know. It's, I, I find it funny. Also, I, I, I will end it on this, right? Is I found a guy on, um, on uh, TikTok and the video was all about and he does a multiple, multiple versions of this video where he talks about between 2024 and 2004 is 20 years, right? And those 20 years feel a lot less uh, different to each other than from 2004 back to 1984, which is 20 years as well. And the way he talked about it was in films. He was talking about Mean Girls, right? The film Mean Girls that came out in 2004, 20 years ago, is now being remade uh, and it's called Mean Girls and it's a musical. And he was like, if you watch Mean Girls from 2004, it feels like it could be, apart from the flip phones that they have in there, it feels like it's a more modern film. And if you, but if you compared it in 2004 when you watched a film from, two, from 1984, it felt like a whole massive thing. And I think, going back to this Apple-Samsung copying each other thing, it feels like technology hasn't really gotten... The first iPhone came out in 2007. That's almost 20 years ago. And it's basically the same thing. It's got a camera. It's a phone with a touch screen. Granted, the iPhone was kind of the first company to go with a touch screen and get rid of the keyboard. But since then, there's not been that much, that huge of an evolution in the concept of a smartphone, right? And that's 20 years ago, almost. Whereas from 1984 to 2000, or 1987, to 2007 when the iPhone came out. I mean, out, I mean, maybe with these VR headsets now that are coming out, that's going to be like the next thing. Anyway, a uh, bit of a technology geek, but also I don't really know anything about technology. All I know from technology is watching videos uh, on YouTube from Marquez Brownlee, MKBHD. What a legend. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you from my hotel room in New York, Monday Night Live. I'm going to carry on uh, talking to my team on Patreon because uh, every week I, uh, I, I give an extra show for the people that support me on Patreon, patreon.com slash, I guess the slash is that way. No, it's that way, isn't it? I'm backwards. No, is it that way? It doesn't matter. Patreon.com slash Paul Taylor. You can buy me some virtual beers and in return you get extra content, uh, an extra Monday Night Live every week and also uh, a bunch of exclusive videos, content, chats. We talk to each other. We do meetups before the shows. Uh, sometimes you get uh, uh, money off of the shows talking about ticket prices. Uh, you get a percentage off the tickets to my shows. Uh, so yeah, come and join me on Patreon and uh, I'll see you there uh, if you're part of Patreon. If you're not part of Patreon, uh, then you should be, but don't worry about it. Uh, if you're not part of Patreon, then uh, I love you anyway. Thank you for tuning in to Monday Night Live. And, I mean, it's Monday afternoon live. It's getting darker. It's getting darker. It is 4.07 p.m. Uh, New York time. And uh, I'll see you next week from my house. Monday Night Live, 9 p.m. next Monday. That is it. Thanks, everyone. Patreon, I'll see you in a couple of minutes. Bees, bye.